ready for another VisionCon Q&A? There you go. It's all you. All me. What's going on, guys? Hey. Well, VisionCon is going on, but let me try again. How's it going, guys? Cool. <laughs> a little better, a little better. Okay, okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the one, the only, Mr. Zach. There we go. There we go. They're awake now. That's better. All right, all right guys, for our final guest interview for the day, we got a real showstopper for you. Fans of this actor will know him from such roles as Lord Zemnis from Kingdom Hearts. Kuruma from Naruto, Leomon from Digimon, just to name a few. He's an actor with a thunderous voice, but a heart of gold. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the one, the only, Mr. Paul St. Peter! Good evening, everyone. How you doing? <laughs> Fantastic. Would you like to tell the class what that means? Or is it better if you don't? Uh, in this case, it's a G-rated, yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I'm taking pictures of you guys. Flipping the script. I love it. <laughs> it's okay. There's no film in this camera. It's just a prop. Thank you. No, no, I actually really like this because normally people take pictures of you, but now you're flipping the script. See, showing them what that, what that feels like. No, sure. It's what you got to do. <laughs> well, how you doing? Doing very well, having a great time. VisionCon, guys, you are kicking it. This is great. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's been, how's Springfield treating you, more importantly? Oh, fantastic. Great time, loving the food, loving the, the entire atmosphere, loving the big storm last night. That was adventurous, wasn't it? Came out of nowhere, too. Yeah. Well, I'm from North Dakota, so I mean, hearing about tornadoes doesn't surprise me. But um, it all seemed so quiet when we went to bed last night. <laughs> right, right, yeah, it was all quiet. I mean, it was kind of maybe drizzling a tiny bit, but then all of a sudden, thunderclaps, almost hail, it seemed. My window was just like... <laughs> That's what woke me up. I thought there was something wrong, like a fan was starting to blow the, uh, the, the slats against the window or something. I go, what is that? I'm looking around and there's nothing moving. And then I saw a flash of lightning. I went, oh, okay, now I get it. Hailstorm? Oh, no. that, that all makes sense. Checks out, checks out. Yeah. This humidity is what's doing me the most, honestly. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> so, Paul, let's go ahead and get started. We're having a couple people trickle in, but we'll go ahead and kick it off. So, Paul, household name, world-renowned actor and voice actor. We're what, gonna... what times are you getting here? Uh, probably after this. Oh, okay. He's just... Oh, he's talking about me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Who else would I be talking to? We're going to get to all of that, but I wanted to start us out with how we got here. Showbiz always the plan? There's something else happening later in life that brought us to where we are today. Um... Rather early age, I used to play street football in San Diego, and my neighbor across the street was our quarterback, and he was always talking about how much fun drama was. He always had a terrific time in drama class doing plays. He said, it is such a blast. And so when I got to the point in school where I could take drama, I did. And uh, a good friend of mine, Archie Lee Simpson, an actor with whom I've done quite a bit of Shakespeare, refers to it as the sickness. And it, it gets in your blood, and you can't stop. You have to perform. I would love to do Shakespeare right now. I just no way my schedule allows it. But I adore it. I love the performing. I love the rush, the creative stuff that goes on, the things that happen on stage live. Ah, there's no replacing it. And that was from a rather young age. And I just did just keep feeding and feeding, and I kept doing more things. You know. So when you say a Shakespearean actor, is there, what is the discernible difference between a Shakespearean actor versus just a traditional actor? Well, if uh, 
the training you get to do Shakespeare is very, very uh, demanding. Shakespeare itself is very demanding. This is difficult stuff to do. Uh, Speech-wise, uh, vocally, what you need to do in terms of breath control and doing very, very strict uh, uh, verse, which is poetry. And you need to make all of that make sense. You need to have all of the acting intentions and all of the intensity, but doing that with this phenomenal verse that you're doing, written by the bard. Uh, many actors can't do it. Um, I've known many an actor that said, no, Mr. Shakespeare and I are not friends. <laughs> no. Oh well. I did 11 seasons of the Nevada Shakespeare Festival. I would not trade one minute of that stuff. It's so wonderful. You know? Especially when you're doing a comedy and people that don't know Shakespeare are laughing, they're splitting their sides. It's a really, really rewarding feeling. You know? By the way, if anybody comes in late, we have to go, one of us. One of us. <laughs> One of us. That's One right. of them. Okay. I did that in Australia. I did the first uh, convention they ever had in Darwin, which is on the north coast in uh, the Northern Territory. And uh, they never had a convention there. Now, Australia, of course, is gigantic. So there's a lot of cons there. They actually have a lot of con activity. But you can be a thousand miles away from the closest one. And so Darwin had never had it, and they were. The great cosplayers were there, it was, all the energy was fantastic, but they didn't know what you guys know. They didn't know the con culture. Because if I wanted to announce something, I would tell you guys, drum roll please, you know. Yeah, and you know it, you're, you're ready to go. So I said, drum roll please, and they... You just didn't trap. Had no idea what I was doing, so I taught them, you know. And when I did the One of Us part two, they were, they were just looking. I said, okay, here's how to be a mean person. I had to teach them, you know. One of us, one of us. So now they do it. You know, so. <laughs> I corrupted them. Yay. Corrupting, trend setting, you know, it's, they're one of the same. So let's go ahead and I want to go down the list of some of the characters that I'd like to explore a little more about. So the first one comes to no surprise. Let's talk a little bit about Lord Zemnis. Two of us, two of us, <laughs> two of us, two of us. Two of us. So, two more of us, two more of us. <laughs> Welcome, thank you all for coming. So yes, Lord Zemnis, um, I was not familiar with uh, Kingdom Hearts 1, and so when I was approached about doing this, uh, Zemnis was a brand new character. And so, I was given very, very little background. One thing about doing anime games and things like that, when we as actors go in, they have almost no time to tell us anything. So they will give us a little bit of information. They told me a little bit about Organization 13, told me a little bit about the relationships I had with other characters, and then it's sort of like, on your mark, get set, act. So, I, a lot of what I've done has been developed over the time. I had a great director named Bob Buckholz. He was the one that handled me for quite a few of the first things that I did. And so, he and the clients that could be anywhere in the world listening in on the phone, uh, were coaching me and going along, and that's how we fashioned that character, and he turned into that uh, rather enigmatic, sometimes evil, but, and I don't want to do a spoiler here, but somewhat tragic character. Um, so the multifaceted thing, that's part of what attracts the, me to the role. So the fact that you only received such limited exposure, limited context to a franchise, as we all know, Kingdom Hearts, doesn't get much more complex than that. <laughs> what then, is that then up to the director to really kind of get you and lead you into the right direction? Yeah, um, the director's job in the case of games and anime, since these shows are often brand new, nobody's seen them yet, including the actors, okay, they need to go ahead and brief you about the world. Uh, might even be, uh, like I've been doing quite a few things for Netflix, which are live action. Um, so they need to tell you the story, like one I'm, I just did recently, which is called uh, Vote Juan, and it takes place in Spain. A very, very, very funny thing about Spanish politics and crazy stuff like that. He needed to tell me about the story from A to Z, because again, I hadn't seen it before. And so you are given as much information as you possibly can ingest 
But there isn't much time to sit and talk about it because we're actually there to work. And like I say, on your mark, get set, act. Uh, luckily, if your director has versed him or herself in this uh, world, this series, this game, um, this animated series, they'll give you the reasons, the whys and the wherefores. So you can also go from there. Sometimes it's up to you to bring different meaning and, and different depth to it, though. Which is why they cast us. And speaking of depth, I mean, you voiced countless complex and dynamic characters, both protagonists and antagonists. So I wanted to say, is there anything about Zemus in particular that kind of makes him stick out from the fray? I like the um, cold. I like the chill. Um, when I talk about being uh, a boss, Zemus being leader of Organization 13, there's a reason I never have to shout. It's because I'm in charge. So you never have to raise your voice if you're really the boss. You know? I love that. The writing also leads me to these wonderful directions, the things that you get to say. And again, not to spoil anything, but uh, the final scenes and the dialogue in there just is gut-wrenching. I mean, absolutely gut-wrenching. Um, so the chance to stretch as an actor is really terrific. It's one of those things I like about the games is they're becoming more complex. And the writing's getting better. Wow. Absolutely. With each game, it's just getting consistent and consistently better. And I don't know what it is about modern gaming, but they've, I, think, I feel like they've finally found a good platform, a good framework to actually create some really engaging media. Well, I think the whole, uh, uh, the entire genre is finding itself. You know, a lot of that had to do with the fact that uh, for the longest time, well, it's just a video game. Who cares? So now they're finding out that you guys want the character. You guys want the depth. You guys want the personalities. And so they're writing better and better because they're listening. And thank you for saying things. When people get on there um, and say, hey, what was up? None of that made any sense. They need to uh, write better scripts. Eventually, I, I want to say that they hear it or they learn it. Eventually they do. And so it's a joy to go in and actually do something where this, the writing is so good. Then it, it unlocks you as an actor. You're not worried about the technical stuff, or I'm not worried about how am I going to fix this? <laughs> because sometimes you will. You look at the way the line is written, and you're just you're shaking your head, or inwardly you're shaking your head, because you're going to have to fix this. And sometimes I'll say, okay, it's a little awkward here. Um, maybe we could try it like this, or let me try a, another take on the line. You know, if they're smart, they will trust the people that have been around a long time, like me. You know. I didn't invent dirt, but I own the patent, okay? So I've been around quite a long time. So they trust me to, uh, in, in some cases, help out, change the writing, rewrite, and stuff like that. It is simply getting better again, uh, I think, when you found talking the platform, that's a good way of putting it, too. Games are coming into their own because people are realizing that you guys want better plots. And yeah, yeah we want better tech, and, you know, greater fights, and more realistic lightning and stuff like that. That's all terrific. But you also want better character and better stories, greater depth, and really the, um, uh, the, the guts that we're after are starting to be written into these things. So it's better for me as an actor to go on and say, like, yeah, now I can go ahead and you know, stretch and be creative and all that. Because you know? again, the attitude is changing. Anime is uh, now being looked upon as a collection of parables. These are the things we learned as kids. And we learned about uh, interacting with our fellows and with uh, other members of groups wherever we were. So they become the parables from which we learn as opposed to they're just cartoons or you're playing a hang video game. No, this is actually connecting with you. You're seeing what goes on and how these characters develop. You know? So it's getting much, much greater than and like you said, I think it's a great word. It's finding its platform. And circling back to what you said regarding you are a wise, experienced member of the acting realm, and so you can make these edits or suggestions, and set by the sound of it, more often than not, they take you at your value. But have you ever received or had any pushback from any of that? Maybe somebody just has a hard time taking criticism? Um, I find that there are many cases where the younger directors um, will say stuff to me like, I'm, 
I've want, always wanted to direct, I've always dreamt of directing you, and, and here we are. And they tend to um, go with things I say because the respect and, and the history and all that thing. But sometimes you will get um, younger directors that are really trying to establish themselves and feel their oats, and they feel like they have to put everybody else in place. A bad director does that and uh, alienates people. Uh, as far as the actual pushback one time, and this guy's a good friend of mine, it wasn't hostile. But I, I thought, okay, well, I could do it like this and fix that, and da 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 da. He says, all right, take your director's beret off and let me do my job, you know. Well, he, was, he was being fun, but, but that was a case where it was like, okay, I know he doesn't want this. So. You'll, you'll get that on occasion, yeah. Nothing too hostile. No. Yeah, yes. All right. Well, kind of moving on, I kind of want to. Oh, oh we good? Oh, he's gone. <laughs> I think we're good. I think we're good. So I'm going to move on to... Hello? Hello? Two, two. Two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Let's... There he is. He's, he's uh, dropping on now. Hello? Mother Nature called. What do, I, what do I need? Oh, this mic. I mean, I could yell. Sorry. <laughs> Mic check. Hello, guys. Hello. Give it up for Scott, ladies and gentlemen. Ah, rock on, Scott. Coming in clutch. That's right. But this this guy, Mike, we're always checking for him. But does he ever show up? I've never seen him. Mike, are you out there? He's never around. Trust me. After hmm? 30 years, he's what? never around. Never around when you need him. That's definitely a typical, typical man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, what are we talking about? We're doing an interview, right? Yes, we are. Ooh. Let's talk about Corona. Weirdest transition ever. <laughs> um, Kurama from Naruto, um, and the story overall, not just the characters, but the story overall has been this amazing arc. Uh, those of you who have followed the 700 plus episodes of Naruto, <laughs> and, and going into Boruto, um, the way the story began, this wasn't explained to me very well because, again, it's one of those, uh, okay, uh, you're a, a giant fox uh, with nine tails, and this is a little kid named Naruto, and uh, there's a village, okay, and let's go, you know. So I had to learn as I was going along, you know, because, and it's not their fault, there's just no time. They never budget time to talk about the scripts and sit around and have a table reading, you know. We couldn't do this. They don't even have ten minutes to do this. You're missing out. Oh, exactly right, you know. Uh, I had to go in and sort of learn as we went, but it was great to learn as I was going along what um, Kurama meant to Naruto. And uh, those of you who know the series from the very beginning and know Japanese anime overall, whenever a character gets tense or worried, there's that little animation beat of sweat, right? And so there would be Naruto, the little boy, looking up at me in the cage, and all that stuff, and he's. And I'm looking down and I'm saying, Naruto, give me your chakra, and I will give you power. And, and he turns around and runs away. Now I know someday I'm going to get him, which is why when he'd run away I would do this. <laughs> I represented at that time temptation. And he grew up, each time he re resent, you know, uh, resisted that, each time he tried to stay with his own devices instead of just automatically grab the help, he grew up, he matured. And that was part of the actual storyline. We've gotten to the point now, uh, or at one point in the series, where we have turned into an old married couple. Um, we had this one particular scene where he kept sniping at me, I kept sniping back. He wouldn't shut up, I wouldn't shut up. We were just frustrated. And I finally just, and this is in the script, I looked at him and I said, knock it off, you little bastard. <laughs> and I, I couldn't stop laughing, we had to take a break. You know? I said, wow, what a moment. But that's part of, again, the story arc, what uh, Naruto and Kurama have meant to each other. And now it's just, the, you know, this big guardian nine-tailed fox that has made such a big difference. The story has grown, we've all grown as actors with it, and the, the storyline has been wonderful. Those who know the manga from the beginning and know the series from the beginning, 
know what I'm talking about. It really is worth the journey. It's a lot of episodes, but it is worth the journey. So that's one of your oldest roles, too. What, 16 years? Uh, actually, I think it's just about 17 years. And we're, I started with uh, Kingdom Hearts at, at 16 years ago. We have the 20th anniversary, but that was Kingdom Hearts 1. And again, Zemmus wasn't in that. It's a great role of uh, playing uh, Kuraba, the Nine-Tailed Demon Fox. It's one of my favorites I've ever done. So sticking with these characters for so long, does that help create a sort of sentimentality to them? Yeah, I don't... I, I can't speak for every other actor, but I, I think I can say that just about every actor does get attached to these roles. Even though they might go, no, 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 it's just a job. No, they, no we do. I can say probably 99% of us do. And for me especially, um, as the writing gets better and the, the characters are more fleshed out, you do get attached, you know. Um, the way things uh, were the last time I worked on Xemnas, um, there was so, it was so gutsy, you know. Now you feel like I want to go back and do more of that. Same with uh, Kurama. That's a role that just uh, evolves and evolves and evolves and it gets deeper and more complex and more fascinating to me to perform, so absolutely. One of the deepest voices in anime. Yeah, and actually it's not that deep a voice in terms of my normal range. Fair, fair. Yeah, because, uh, and I didn't know, realize this really until recently, the deepest voice I do is not one of my monster voices. Okay. If you listen to my range, this is my what's called my median note. Okay, right here is the your median note is the comfortable note from which you speak almost every time you start there. So my median note is here, and when you hear me turn into Kurama the Nine Tail Demon Fox, I'm still on my median note, aren't I? I haven't made my voice deeper. This is all part of my panel called uh, Voice Maker, um, uh, but I'm giving you a little taste of that. When I realized that, and I. I was uh, speaking in, in the character or just ad-libbing or something like that. I'm here right in the middle of my voice. The actual deepest voice I do is the tiniest little character I do from Digimon. Really? Yeah. I, I told you when I'm doing my medium pitch, now listen carefully as I go down here and I'm talking as Wormmon. Did you hear what I just did? I dropped three or four notes deeper for the tiniest little worm guy, the cutest little guy you want to pick him up. It's the deepest voice I do. Well, for those deep ones, and I, more often than not probably in your monster characters, what, I mean, you are very experienced, totally granted, so you probably have uh, a lot more resistance to uh, uh, throat conditions than some, but during some of the more dexterity-inducing sessions, what do you do to kind of avoid any lasting damage? The important thing for me, um, when I'm doing those voices, if you listen carefully to the way I'm doing this right now, what qualities are you hearing? And you can raise your hand on this one if you like, if you thought of something. Audience? Yes. Oh, back there. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, Ian. For, oh, okay, that, we'll get right back to you. Okay. You know, I leave him alone for five minutes and he's jumping off and breaking his leg. And like, I'm hearing a lot of vocal fry. Uh, there's a little bit of vocal fry, um, but you're accurate. That is, and that's actually the right uh, term for that. It's called glottic fry. The epiglottis back here, and you're going. See, your vocal cords are supposed to resonate free like this, and when I do that, I'm actually scraping them together. The question really comes down to how do I get away with this? You're hearing the fry, but you're hearing me breathe through it. And that's how I can get away with it for five hours. And I'm only a little bit fatigued at the end because I know how to do it. Which is why I advise everyone that wants to do monster voices, don't do them until you get trained. Because uh, five minutes after they start, people have blood shooting out of their ears. It's, it's really terrible. Uh, because they don't know how to do it. Um, so it's that quality, but what else am I doing? Yes. Uh, raspy, that's it's kind of the quality of what he was talking about. But if you're working on a voice and the word raspy is better for you than using glottic fry or something else, write that down and use it. 
That's what you heard, that's what it means to you, so it's a good answer. Yeah. But yeah, that rasping quality. Actually, a lot of kurama is whispering. You hear that? It's a whispery quality. So I'm not actually pushing my voice very hard, and because I'm putting a whisper in it, I'm breathing through the process. Instead of doing this. That's the one that will kill you in five minutes, okay? And that's the mistake everybody makes. Well, I hear these guys on these heavy metal rocks are going, Yeah, that's why these guys can't do performances two nights in a row. They come off stage going, like that. So you need to know what you're doing. Um, the, you know, what you're touching upon is very important because you can, in fact, damage your voice long term. And I've seen actual pictures of, of vocal folds that have blood blisters on them. And you literally take 30 days of not speaking at all for that to heal. So if you're dang right I know what I'm doing when I get this stuff because I, I, can't, I can't do that to myself. I, I would be ashamed of myself if I did too. Well, that and that eliminates your main or at least biggest source of income as well if anything ever happens to your voice. Oh yeah, and this, uh, about a month ago I came back from a convention. I would gotten a sore throat while I was there. That can happen for a lot of reasons. You know, I come from uh, Southern California. The weather's very changeable there, but typically dry. I go to another city where it's uh, cooler, another place I go where it's hotter but humid. I go into a hotel room with air conditioning, I go outside. All these weird things happen to me, and I'm very careful about my, my health, my vocal health. This time I caught this sore throat and went, okay, air conditioning, right? Got home, it moved down, and I got, for the first time in 40 years, laryngitis. <sighs> Yeah, of all things for a voice actor. And then bronchitis kicked in. It was, it was a, a terrible two weeks or so. Um, so being able to take care of your voice and knowing what to do, very, very important. Um, but yeah, when I got laryngitis, I was like... Of all the things. Yeah, of all the things. I could have taken anything else, but having my voice do that, uh, it's just a disaster. You know? So would you say that for a lot of, because there's a lot of technicalities, a lot of science into what you just said, I would argue that a lot of us, maybe even all of us, weren't even privy to. So with the accessibility for people thanks to modern technology to make audition tapes, to audition for roles, or the convenience of their own home sometimes, for a lot of aspiring actors and voice actors, do you think that the fact that a lot of them are probably not privy to stuff like that possibly holds them back? Absolutely. Um, the thing to remember, if you're going to go and try and become a voice actor, really the first thing you have to do is become an actor. Um, you need to ground yourself in your technique, you need to get a lot of experience, you need to spend time on stage. Uh, the greatest teacher of all is getting up on a live stage and uh, performing theater, performing plays, and doing improv. That's better than anything else you can do. You learn to think on your feet, you learn to trust your instincts. And that is gigantic. <coughs> Excuse me. The problem a lot of people have is they don't do the workshops, and they're in a place where there's no theater, perhaps. Maybe you're, you're in a smaller town, there's not a theater group. My solution to that is start one. Uh, you might be the person, maybe you don't that, know that much about it, but start a theater company. It's amazing how many people will gravitate toward you. Some of them will have more experience in what you're trying to do, uh, but ultimately it's getting it done. Uh, train, 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 and there are lots and lots of websites that talk about um, the things I'm doing. Not everybody is a dialectician like I am, or a linguist, um, a phoneticist and stuff like that, but they can still teach you good things. You know? <coughs> One second, please. Speaking of dry. Say it's not back, is it? No, no, no. <laughs> Bite your tongue, don't say that. Knock on wood. Well done. Appreciate that. Being a DJ, I know. You gotta have water. Oh, you got that oh, right. Got that right. So, we're going... <laughs> I know, let's have a stirring contest. I, I'll lose, I'll lose, I wear contacts. Oh, boy. 
So the last character I wanted to talk about before I kick it off to you guys for some uh, audience questions. Let's talk about a character who's seen a bit of a resurgence lately, and especially the pla the uh, series that's from itself has recently gotten uh, a lot more popular. Uh, let's talk about Leomon from Digimon. Okay. Yeah. Like many actors, I'm very much attracted to the, the bad guy characters, or the enigmatic ones, or the mysterious and all that stuff. Leo Mann was the hero that I liked to play the most. There was something about when uh, somebody was going to go after the kids and try to threaten them, and Leo Mann would jump in and bring his hammer down and open a fissure in the earth, and he would say, You will not harm these children. There was something about that character that just, you know, to this day, when I watch something like that, I'm like, yes, yes, that was me. Yeah, and it's just great. And the way the character fit in, and the way he taught the kids and mentored them, really meant a lot. You know, that's why I talk about the anime of these days is turning more into parables for us to learn from. Um, those are the stories. Those are the things that uh, teach us as children and resonate as adults. Uh, I, I hear this all the time. You guys have come by my uh, autograph table. You'll look at my Digimon pictures and say, this was my childhood. And that means a lot to us because, uh, the, honestly, a lot of jobs I've done are for uh, shows that have never gone on the air. We finish them up, somebody says, great, they put it up on a shelf somewhere, and 20 years later it's still gathering dust. Uh, to know that we put those things out there and they made a difference to you really does make a difference for us. It's huge. And thank you, thank you all for being, you know, there to appreciate what we did. And I'm not exaggerating when I say we can't do what we do without you guys. You really are that important. And as fans of games especially, you're finding more and more that your voices are heard. Because when somebody is uh, doing a, let's say, Soul Calibur V, as a matter of fact, when I was the narrator for that, um, Part of what made that job so difficult was, first of all, they wanted me to do the entire thing in one day. That was tough, you know. Um, but the script wasn't very well written, and it's awkward to do bad writing. And after the game came out, the, the people that made the game were listening when you guys said, you know, a lot of the dialogue was, or the, the, the narration was choppy and this sort of thing. By heavens, when they called me for Soul Calibur VI, that was a great script. <laughs> Thank you, all of you, for doing that. Because they said, yeah, you know, to engage them in the game, especially with a narrator, you're going to be hearing me a lot. I don't mean just, you know, long sword, fight, you know, nothing like that. But the actual story and explaining all these things made a gigantic difference because now, yes, I was still doing a lot of uh, copy, but it's much easier to do when it's well written. And I was doing this stuff and it was poetic and it was stirring and all these wonderful things. And I said, where were these guys for Soul Calibur V? You know? And I talked about this earlier too. Sometimes they're learning and they make the writing gets better and better as they go. Sometimes they hire new writers, but it's because you guys are demanding better character, better acting, better writing, better stories, everything. So again, thank you to you guys. That sure made that day a lot easier for me, I can tell you. <laughs> well, and us gamers, I mean, we've evolved over the years, and especially with video games costing more and more every five to ten years, I mean, we, I would say we demand better. We would just demand, yes, better design, but also better writing, better characterization. So, in our minds, I feel like it's the company's due diligence to give that to us, or we won't give them the income that they need. Well, my feeling is that from day one, from the very beginning, they owed that to you, and they just figured it wouldn't matter that much. Um, it's the reason why when you're looking at the comments that people put on the net about uh, a new game or a new episode or a new season or something, they're saying, hey, wait a minute, they didn't wrap up blah, 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 and so-and-so. And that has to be addressed. And sometimes I will come in for a rewrite and say, Okay, we had to add a paragraph here because we we left a guy hanging off of a cliff, you know? So, how did we get him, you know? So, you're the guy, you get to say how it happened, you know? Uh, did you hear about, you know, Joe? Yeah, well, thank God there was somebody nearby with a rope, okay? And so you find out that Joe is safe now. Now we can go on with the story. But you guys notice that. 
you guys are waiting for the answer. It's like literally like a cliffhanger like that. Well, you know, 10 episodes later, another season later, poor Joe is still out there going, help! You know? <laughs> so they need to pay attention to that stuff, and it's because you guys are listening and watching. I'm the same way. If I come in and there's been a three episode break, I want to know what happened to them. Am I going to be the guy talking about it? Am I the guy that saved him? Who knows, you know? So we need to know these things. The dil diligence everyone here of loving the games as much as you do the animes and following that and really paying attention to that, that's making them better, okay? But they're, again, either better writers or the writers uh, are getting better, as the case may be, uh, and they're getting better story development too because the creators of the games, if they're in Japan or I've done some from France and some from Germany, um, where uh, they seem to be a little more organized in terms of the quality of the product, but not because they're better than the Japanese, they just don't put out as much stuff. You know? So that, that there are things, there are elements of that. And you know, God bless the Japanese for doing all the stuff that they do because they're always giving us this terrific stuff and it's getting better and better and more gorgeous and you know, characters much deeper and all that. But again, just my message to you guys is thank you for making what I do better. So we've got about 10 minutes left, so I want to turn the mic to you guys. If you guys have a question for Paul St. Peter, raise your hand, and I'll go around and bring the mic to you. Hey there. Um, oh. So, go figure, it's about Zemnis. Um, I've noticed that Zemnis has an almost seductive quality to his voice, you know, that sort of charismatic leader sort of thing. I don't know what you mean. There it is. <laughs> so, I was wondering, was that something that you elected to bring to that character? Because it is very well suited to him, or was that just part of the direction that you were given for the character? Um, the voice you hear me doing as Zemnis was the voice I brought to the audition. The quality you're talking about was the result of the direction because, and I always like to express it this way as part of what you have to face as an actor in some of the challenges. Um, the lines were written this long, and the timing in the Japanese was this long. And I was faced with that all the time. So I went in with this voice to, to be ready to do this, and I said, okay, um, what we're going to have to do is make sure that we elongate all these things, and so <laughs> So, suddenly, now, my ends are S's and Z's are like this, and I have the longest pronounced K in the industry. <laughs> I, that, I had to literally do that stuff because they wouldn't even let us add a word. If we say can't, which is a contraction, they wouldn't let me uncontract and say cannot to add at least one more syllable. Help! Right? <laughs> that's how that happened. And now the seductive quality and all that stuff, well, that's what I bring. <laughs> but actually, that's all part of it. So I had to elongate and do all this stuff, and that is what changed the vocal delivery a little bit. Okay, so it's a little bit breathier and a little bit throatier uh, than what I originally brought because I didn't know I was going to be doing <laughs> five <laughs> syllables over ten seconds. You know, because it's almost that bad. It's really almost that bad. And I thought it was going to be terrible. I did my first session like that, and it was four hours long. We finished. It brought me in a couple of days later to the next four hours. I thought, all right, we're probably going to hear it. And so I'm in the booth. The director gets on the talk back and says, okay, they really loved everything, so let's keep going. <laughs> I was shocked. I thought they would go, okay, we got to go in another direction. They bought it. And that's why we have the Zenness we do today. That's not the one I brought to the audition, I promise you. <laughs> it's beautiful. All right, anybody else? Oh, right here, sir. Now, don't jump. I just, I'm just a big fan of cardio. Why do, I, why do you think I stay so thin? I'm a big fan of keeping your joints working, so... Oh, almost sounds like you care. Almost. <laughs> so is there anything that's kind of a deal-breaker moment for you, where you go in for a role and you're like, no, this isn't really for me, and kind of turns you away from any project? 
Um, I've never had to do that, luckily. Um, you find out in the audition process, typically, because they will tell you, this is the project, this is what the character does. Um, uh, when I did um, Berserk as a Grunbelt, okay, now they did tell me in advance on the internet, on the email that they sent, that this is very much an R-rated and bloody, brutal series with, you know, sexual violence and you name it. So they tell you that in advance. So if you have a problem with that, you know, uh, you can opt out. Because sometimes that will happen. Sometimes it, it goes against your beliefs or um, uh, the, the writing, the language and stuff like that. You don't want to do it. And I appreciate them telling us in advance. Sometimes though you go in there and, uh, well, guess what? <laughs> you know what this is about? Here it is, you know. But also, I as an actor always have the option of walking out, and I will, whether it costs me money or not. You know, I'll simply say, uh-uh, not gonna happen. And mind you, it takes a bit of courage, especially when you're, you're, you're counting the dollars sometimes, you know. I can't afford to walk off of this job, I need the money, you know. Um, but there are times when just for your own self-respect, you need to keep that option open for yourself, you know. And you know, um, such is my place in my world of anime and games that if I did that, they would respect me and it wouldn't cost me work later on. If you're brand new, sometimes you just need to do the job because you need the money and you need to establish yourself. Voiceover is hard to get into and it's hard to stay in. It really is. All right, we got time for one more question. One more. Make it a good one. Oh, buy me. <laughs> oh, there he is. Sold to the gentleman in the red shirt. <laughs> so you talked about like what it, uh, some advice you had for like newbies trying to get into it, and you said to go into like theater and stuff like that. So my question is, what about the intermediates that have you know been in theater for a long time? They've done a lot of you know acting on stage or whatever, but they're wanting to get into more of the voice acting and break into that. What advice would you have for them? Well, first of all, keep doing stage as much as you can. Um, you're never an expert. There's always more. You're always going to be learning that, so, so don't stop. <laughs> um, now, for me, it's a matter of scheduling. I can't do plays now, but I would say go for it. Um, in terms of that, um, make sure you're developing voices. You're writing them down. Shh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, make sure that you're developing uh, the vocal quality. You sound like you know a little bit about what you're doing, like with the Claudia Cry thing and all that, so by all means, take care of the instrument. But start developing voices and then be ready to submit, uh, I don't want to say necessarily a demo tape, but if you get in touch with a studio and they say, you know, well, what do you do? And you say, oh, okay, my, my range is medium to high and I, I sound like I'm 25 to 35 or whatever. So you give them that little breakdown about yourself. Um, and then you would submit samples to them when they ask. Um, that's the way to get going on that. But by all means, keep doing theater, and as you're developing voices, write the things down that you do. I name my characters. So when I create a voice, I name the character so I can key into it faster. You know, Sometimes it has to do with the quality of the voice. If I'm doing an audition and I'm using my Zemnis voice, I take the copy and I write Zemnis on top. Nice and easy, you know. It's my Zemnis voice. Hi, Winnie. <laughs> uh, so my advice, first of all, for any of you who want to become actors, is don't. <laughs> it's not a path to happiness, I promise you. It can be artistically satisfying, but you don't find happiness as an actor, you find happiness in real life. And maybe some satisfaction as an actor, but it's not a path to go. Um, you will do it, though, if you know that you have to. Other than possibly being uh, an archaeologist, literally nothing else appeals to me. It's a good thing because I believe it down to the marrow of my bones. And I know when I'm working that there's nothing else on the planet. That's why I'm three feet off the ground when I work. That's why when I, I finish a session and get home a little while, I really crash from three feet up. <laughs> Uh, but it's like that for me. You know if you have to do it. A true writer has to write. A true actor must act. A lot of times, I've seen this happen many times, many of my acting friends that have moved back to, you know, Indiana or wherever they're from, 
because uh, they thought it was a great idea and it would be a lot of fun. And I can get rich being an actor, I can eventually produce movies. And they're there for all the wrong reasons and they find out how difficult it is and they leave. Rightly so. But make sure again, if it's something that you have to do, then do it. If you have any doubts, don't. Find something that will help you make, make you happy. Because I can tell you definitely, being an actor is not what makes me happy. It's satisfying, I love it. <clears throat> but it's not the road to happiness by any stretch of the imagination. It's the road to disappointment and rejection and difficulty and trouble paying your bills. You know, lots and lots of different frustrations and difficulties. Uh, if you have to do it, you'll put up with that stuff, if you have to. But you will know. If you don't have to, you will, I don't do it. That's my true advice. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, give me another round of applause for Mr. Paul St. Peter. Addy <laughs> receipts. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank you, Bishop Khan. Thank you for coming back, everyone. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Real quick, in about 30 minutes, we're going to kick off our final event for the main stage. The cosplay contest, who's ready?